Okay, hi. Thank you for hosting me, first of all. Um, thank you for not having retired to the chill room yet, which is an amazing room. You should totally check it out. Um, yeah, basically I'm gonna be talking about my experiences with React Native. So I picked this up like six months ago. Um, it was an incredibly fun journey. So I've been introduced already. My name is Laura Gonzalez. I'm Frizzy the Rito on Twitter. Some people have referred to me as Frizzy when they met me at the lobby. That was weird. I'm a client side developer at the Guardian. And more importantly, I'm sure you are all tired of hearing about React Native now. This seems to be like a very single issue conference. I had the worst day, and I want to tell you about it. So I took a 5 a.m. flight to get here. Um, so basically what happened is um, yesterday I was attending full stack in North Broslov. Um, I flew there at 5 a.m. from London, and to do that, I woke up at 2 a.m. And I don't know if you've seen London at 2 a.m. ever, but it's like very, very, very miserable. Like it makes 2 p.m. London look happy and full of life, which is like not how you see London at any point in your life. And basically, I went there because my friend Sarah Vieira is MCing, and she wanted me to see her. She's React famous, if that means something. You probably know her. And if you don't, follow her on Twitter. She's cool. And right now, she needs a lot of emotional support. And we'll get into the why later. So um, for going here, through it, um, for coming to this city, um, I also got a 5 a.m. flight because I'm sort of an idiot. This is a recurring theme. We'll get into this as well. And I told myself that it would be a great idea to basically not sleep. No, on account of having felt miserable waking up at 2 a.m. Um, before. So my friend was like, Laura, this is a terrible idea. And I was like, look, just let me have this. So come to o'clock, I pop out with the grace of Cinderella, I jam the pile of clothes that looks most like my pile of clothes into my backpack, and jump into a taxi that I almost didn't pay for because I forgot this wasn't a Uber. Um, not tough. So um, anyway, I get to the airport, it's 2 a.m. You might have noticed that some airports have gotten like really good at letting people sleep in them. They have comfy chairs, they have 24-hour McDonald's, and they have no PA announcements. And Barcelona, sadly, is not one of those airports. So when I arrived there, I actually found this adorable scene where the Kili Park had been taken over by people sleeping like they were on some stranded island. So, I joined my stranded island buddies and just like nap for a good hour and another problem arose like I saw my reflection in the glass because there's so much of it. Look at it. And basically, I don't know if you've ever had dyed hair. Maybe your parents loved you, so you don't. But trust me, it does not look good after two days of the showering. So I was a bit more awake at that point and I went on a quest to, feel, to find the airport showers. And lo and behold, the airport has a hotel. And it's inside the airport, and it's terrifying. It looks like an airport and a hotel at the same time. So the rooms are hell expensive, so I didn't get a room. I tried to get a shower. They told me it was for 35 minutes only, which is a very weird amount of time. And also, I was kind of terrified of what's going to happen to 35 minutes if I was still in the shower. So I showered real fast. This is the locker room where I opened my backpack. And I realized that, remember how I put a pile of random clothes? Well, they were. They were not entirely my clothes. So my friend Sarah, normally she only gets one pair of pants every single time. She only has this single pair, she's MCing, she was MCing today. Um, and basically, I'm wearing them today, I got those pants. So um, this is actually how this conversation ended. She left me on red. And do not steal your friend's pants. This is the first thought I want to leave you with today. It's not cool. It's Kind of funny, but not funny. And that was kind of the highlight of my day. And then I came here, and I don't remember a lot because I haven't slept. So life is pain. Um, so speaking of that, let's go back to talking about me. Um, I'm a client-side developer at The Guardian. And now we can begin properly about this. So around five months ago, I overheard that for the next quarter, we were planning to rebuild our iPad-only daily edition app as a PWA. You probably don't know of this app. It's an app to read a newspaper, but in an app-like format. Um, it apparently has subscribers, people who still like newspapers. I like to think of it as the Snapchat stories of news. And right now, it's iPad only. So um, the business proposition was that we were to rebuild this as a web team uh, very quickly and ship it across iPhone and Android and tablets. Me, being the idiot I am, um, once I heard the term PWA, I really wanted to play with React Native, so I asked them if, I, if they had considered React Native. They liked the idea so much that they gave the project to me, which was great. 
But also, I had never used React Native before. <laughs> it was like the most throwaway suggestion on earth. Like the only reason I suggested it was literally because I was, I was hoping somebody else would, would pick it up, learn the heartbeats, and then give it this exact same talk. So, me having a clue what to do is actually important to this story because my development process is a bit like Homer Simpson building his barbecue. Um, this is triply true when there's just so much new stuff to learn, so much new stuff to learn that I get overwhelmed. Now, you don't want your end result to look like the Hummer's barbecue, but I'm a huge believer that most times, especially in software, just jumping out of the plane with no parachute and messing up like five times before getting things right can be um, like more rewarding, more educating, and important and faster pathway to just like sitting down and trying to study all the fundamentals before you dive into it. Um, so, with that in mind, let's talk a bit about what exactly is React and how it compares to React Native. Um, so React basically is the theme where you write weird HTML in title case, you know this. And I think when I started working in React, something that was confusing to me is that there is this huge massive tool chain around React with navigation, Bubble, Redux, Gatsby, lots of tools that go around React, they go around the world of React, and it makes it a bit easy, hard to untangle what exactly is React and what is not. Um, all of these things are super useful. Um, I have personally used like just about everything in this track, but when you take them all at the same time, it's super overwhelming. So if we actually take the core parts of React, we basically have like on our website we would have React and React DOM, and all these two little things do is they make trees, not real trees, of course, but they make metaphorical trees. So. Um, React itself, it gives you ways to define your branches by declaring and nesting components, and it gives you tools to conditionally render those components. Um, now, with React DOM, basically, React DOM talks to the browser, takes all of this that React is doing, and puts it into the actual DOM. Um, and, sucks. Sorry. and when it comes to React Native, um, we basically have the same thing, but it does that on an app. So. That's pretty much it. And like, what's really cool about this, um, at least for me when I started toying with this, is that at the end of the day, you still have a native app. So if you're missing some feature, you can just like, build it yourself. And it's kind of cool. Um, and this is the way your average React Native project looks like. So your JS code goes to the React, React Native front end, which you don't really touch or control. That's nice. Um, it's a and then it's a dependency of an Xcode project and an Android project. Um, that sits in your system, you have full control of it, um, and once you're happy, you publish it to the stores. Um, and you can choose, and you can even publish it to this store. Now, if you wanted extra device functionality, like the camera, the gyro, that React Native doesn't include out of the box, you will have to use native modules, which is like basically native code that you can run in React. Um, and this is honestly, um, especially if you're starting, especially if you're just like considering React Native, this can also be like incredibly overwhelming and hard to separate. So thankfully, we have stuff like Expo that just lets us basically takes control of all the white bits, and we just have to write our JavaScript in return, in return for losing control. And as was said throughout today, you can, you can start using Expo, and you are not vendor locked, which is super nice. And as soon as you experience some minor pain, you can just sort of like eject. And at that point, you are in square one, but at the very least, you don't have to start from square one you could give Expo a shot. Um, now, pains, pains that I experienced, um, the first one would be, honest to God, buying a Mac. Like, it's not been a good year for Macs. This, this one, my own Mac, I had to take it to repair twice already. Like, the top, the top part is new and the bottom part is new. And when I changed the top part, I lost the stickers, and that, that was the saddest time of my life. Um, so. Um, something you can do if you don't want to buy a Mac is you can just sit out at the Apple store, but I don't recommend that because it's kind of like, you know, it's time consuming. Um, also, like setting up Xcode and Android Studio compared to the ease of speed of Expo, also kind of annoying. Like, not annoying, but you don't have to do it if you don't have to do it, and that's nice. Same with CICD, which is basically setting up Xcode and Android Studio in the cloud, which means for Android Studio, it's nice, but for Xcode, you, you don't get nice Xcode checkboxes, and you have to deal with what Xcode actually produces, which is very, very bad. And finally, the last time I did this talk, updating React Native itself was 
an incredible pain, and now, thankfully, it's not anymore, so thanks, Pablo. <sighs> now, um, when it comes to all of this stuff, this is my favorite part of the presentation, because performance, data stores, component hierarchy, our architecture, that's kind of nice because it's the same, so let's, let's get into UI. So, you can use Redux, you can use MobX, you can use class components, hooks, etc. And you don't have to relearn anything there, which is super nice. And it's not to say that these things aren't hard, like something with, something with React Native is that mobile apps have like a way higher bar to reach than web apps and for, and phones are more resource strained anyway, so performance is a bit of a premium. So, in terms of actual differences, um, the things I noticed the most, like obviously, first of all, you don't really get HTML. For the most part, this just means that you just use view instead of div. And that's sort of like your code. A view goes there, the div. Now, where it gets a bit hairy is because it's at the point where you actually want to use like semantic elements and you want to hint something to the screen reader. So you have this cool accessibility, accessibility role property that allows you to assign like the role of an element. And this works a bit like area roles in HTML, and it works a bit like semantic HTML tags. Um, there's a full list of them, and if you're using types, which you probably should. I don't want to say this in public, but you probably should. Um, you can just get them on autocomplete. As well as accessibility roles, you can also use accessibility label. And this is a bit like the alt text that we would use in HTML. And finally, for stuff like buttons, you can use accessibility hint to indicate what would happen after you press the button. So these are your primitives. And now, when it comes to making them look pretty, that's sort of like a huge world of differences. So it's like CSS, but not CSS, but it tries really hard to look like CSS, as you can see. Um, if, you, if you have used emotion on the web or style components, you might be super familiar with this syntax already. And for the most part, it kind of works the same. It's when you try to do layouts that it really gets complicated. So um, for the most part, it uses CSS-like syntax, but for positioning, everything is a flexbox. And behind the scenes, this uses um, Yoga, Facebook's layout engine. You don't really need to know that, but it has a cool website, and you can play around with it. Um, something kind of bad, or good, depending on who you ask, is that it has no cascade and no inheritance, except for text, but let's not get into that. But basically, each element will look plain unless you explicitly add any styles to it. And there are no selectors or global, so all, st all styles are sort of in line. You can define them in your style sheet, but in the end, there is like no, you can't select a child of a component, or you can't, um, or you can't select a hover. And finally, you don't quite get media queries, but um, you can get the device with, and we'll get into that later. But basically, yeah, so it's like a whole new world devoid of actual CSS, and some people might choose to embrace that and break free of the past. That's not me, so let's have a look at what we are actually missing and how we can get it back. So, if everything is a flexbox, this is especially tricky if you are publishing a newspaper because it means you don't have floats or CSS grid. You normally don't want floats, but if you were to have, say, like a massive ass letter at the beginning of the page, suddenly you want something that sort of sits in a box in the top left corner and everything else floats around it. That's a float, like we have been misusing them to actually make layouts for years until we had flexbox. But in this case, we actually want a float. Um, in this particular case, what we did, um, since our article renderer consumes content from our API anyway, and the API assumes that every renderer will be HTML and it just jumps in there, we just basically toss that into a web view. That was an interesting idea. That was an interesting idea. You can probably consider doing that. It worked kind of great for us, but if we were doing it all over again, we would have tried to go full native just because maintain reaching the web view and the React Native app is a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, when it comes to CSS Grid, it's a bit more hairy because Grid is like hella new. So if you have a complex layout, your first intuition might be to use like a ton of flex boxes to get this. But having a good, like a lot of views is not really the best practice. And in fact, um, React gets mobbed for a lot for outputting a ton of divs on the web. So this is kind of the same on mobile. And there is no easy way around this. Like if, you go, if you want a layout like this, 
there is not a lot you can do, and thankfully, um, you don't get layouts like this on phones or iPads that often. But something we are doing, because we have quite a complex editorial layout for the front pages, is we're actually using absolutes. Um, so by using absolute positioning, we can define our own layout. And since we have full control of the JavaScript properties that actually define this layout, we are doing kind of fun in that regard. So um, we can calculate all the widths on the fly, and we can actually position elements where we want them. So it's a bit like the 90s all over again, but with slightly better tools for this. Now, when it comes to Cascade and Inheritance, there are two things you can do to get the fun parts of the Cascade back. Now, one of them you have probably already done if you're used to style components or emotion, and it's just you can pass style, you can take style prop in your component and you can pass it down. Um, styles is an array, so you can just do this very easily, and it type checks and it's amazing. And something kind of funny you can do with, without type checking is that the array gets applied in normal array spread order. So if you have styles that you don't want to be overridden in any case, in any scenario, you can put them at the end. But you should probably type check your components and you should type check your styles. So don't do this. Now, if you want some styles to go like down like several levels deep, you can use context. And the way context works is basically it everything you wrap in it can access that value. And this is actually great for layouts. Like if you have part of the page that you want to have red components, you can just create a red component context and make your components either consume that context or get the default. Context works great for layouts. And it's something I'm actually kind of excited to, you, to try to use in the web now, compared to trying to use like very complex CSS selectors, because this is actually nicer. Um, another thing you can do in regards to context is you can not design your brand, so everything has to basically support like five color schemes, and that should be nicer. And that way you don't have to do that, but not everybody gets that privilege. Um, and finally, when it comes to selectors and globals, again, less of a shock if you have used CSS modules, style components. Um, there is no easy solution for this, so something you can do is, for instance, for lists, I will use the blind star selector a lot for lists to do like separators and dividers in CSS. On React Native, you would use flat list to do just about the same thing. So there are tools for most of the solutions you can make uh, just by checking on the docs. Um, and when it comes to focus, hover, these kinds of states, there are two ways you can go about this. So first of all, you can just use the built-in methods, and they will make items touchable, and you can get the nice Android bubble and the iOS opacity. Or basically, you can implement them yourself. So the first naive approach is to use state, and this actually works, and you just set the state, um, and release, and unset. But as the React docs for very properly tell you, you really don't want to do this because this is like kind of such an ephemeral state that it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to actually use React for this. So by using set native props you can, and using a ref, you can bypass it. So this is actually very powerful if you're doing your own buttons and your own animations. And I highly recommend it over because it's very easy to fall back into using state for this. And doing this, I mean, it's more verbose, but also it's more performant. And yeah, that was re renders, especially in the children. And now finally, when it comes to media queries, if you're making a phone only app, this is incredibly easy to solve. You just don't have to use them. Now, if you're grumpy and you want the same media queries you um, ever wanted in your entire life, you can just get the device dimensions and use those. The only problem with that is that when the device rotates, everything gets a bit messed up. So Two things you can do here. First of all, there's like a lot you can achieve with Flexbox alone and using Max and Mimwith. Second of all, you can use on layout and that will give you container queries. So on layout is a property that all views have. And basically, when it fires, and it fires like a frame after the view is laid on screen, it will give you the coordinates of the diff in screen position and it will give you the height and the width. And you can use that to re-render the contents. The only problem with this is that it's incredibly expensive because you are rendering the div, and then you are telling it, oh, I actually want it different. So what you can do as well, and this is actually what we are doing right now in the production app, is we have a, we have a hook, and we just call dimensions on the window, like in the past, like in the kit example. There we go. Um, and we are subscribed to an event, and when the event fires, we update the hook. And that way, we avoid that flashing that we will get with on layout. Um, speaking of flashing and that, 
When it comes to the bugin, um, having grown used to the Chrome DevTools, uh, the bugin is a bit of a pain in the ass. So React Native gives us on device DevTools, it gives us the normal React DevTools, and it gives us the Chrome DevTools. And they're an amazing set of tools, but when it comes especially to figuring out like layout stuff, Compared to what we have on Chrome, when you can, where you can inspect every element and you have like pointer level precision, in React, I will most often just like paint things to model. And as a, as a person who has done CSS for quite a long time, this kind of makes me think of all the people who use this GIF to talk about CSS, and it makes me feel guilty because I'm clearly not embracing the tools that React Native gives me to the debug stuff. So at this point in my career, um, when, I actually have when I actually have the time, I try to use the proper debugger and I try to familiarize myself with it. And when I actually want to fix something, I will just paint it red. Very, very, very like normal way to go. Um, now, animations. Animations are kind of painful, um, and they're kind of painful because if you're used to CSS animation, CSS animation is awesome. Like, as it, as it turns out, you can get used to a good thing. But however, and something I tell myself to properly sleep at night um, in this case, is that CSS animation is also underpowered. We can see that with the new Houdini APIs that are popping up um, that kind of looks exactly like the ones in React Native. And we can see that with um, most, animation, most animations, basically. Like most animations in an app, if you look at them, they don't happen just because, but they happen as a result of our interactions. Of, as, of, as a result of what our finger is doing. You'll swipe and pan and zoom and move around and use the content, and that will precisely follow your finger or your gesture. So read the docs, they're very good. Um, Rachel is here. If you have any problems with the doc, talks, tell her. Um, but what this, what this boils down is that basically you have this magical animated value. Um, please, somebody correct me on this syntax. If I have, if I have messed it up, I asked on Twitter. Um, all the dogs are pre-hooks, and I'm not entirely sure how to do this with hooks. Um, basically, you're an, you're an emitted value, and that's the important part here, is this number. And this number can magically change over time based on any parameters and based on any inputs. So for instance, here I've got a circle that slowly um, grows and shrinks. Um, so it grows slowly when I press it down, and it deflates super quickly as I lift my finger up. You will have to, to use your imagination for this because I don't have time to record a video. So what we put basically is this um, to value method and that moves the number to a different value. And when you give a duration and when you add a timing function, this value is always moving smoothly, which is super nice. And the value is kind of cool because it can be static or it can be a different emitted value, which lets you make objects that follow each other. Like for example, in this um, example of that bubbles in Facebook Home, which is no longer a thing, but it makes for a nice GIF. Mm, like, there's a lot more to animation to cover, but I'm hoping this gave you curiosity enough to try if you have never used React Native. <laughs> um, now, all of this stuff is great, but at some point you probably um, you're wanna have you're wanna, gonna wanna have more than one page in your app. Um, you can actually use the normal React Router from web, but you don't want to do that because since we're building an app, we want something that handles moving pages um, a bit more at the OS level. So if, you don't, if you've done single page React app before, a lot of this might be familiar because basically a lot of the future of web app development is based on mobile apps. But something that I feel is very important um, from an interaction standpoint is that your app is a physical place. And that sounds super ridiculous and super pretentious, but it's also true. So what I mean by this is if you look at the settings menu on iOS, everything sort of like swipes and pans and zooms around, and zooms around. like I said, it follows your finger, screens pop from places, they collapse into places. And this is not only like very nice to look, but also it gives you a sense of speciality. You know where you are because you know where you came from. And you know, where, you know this screen came from the bottom. And you know that means something different than when a screen comes from the left. Um, you may not, you don't actually have to necessarily believe in this, but something that is kind of true is that everybody else is doing it and you don't want to be the weird one. So that puts a huge expectation on mobile apps that we don't have on the web. So something to keep in mind is that on a normal website, for instance, if you, this is a horrible example because this is actually a React Native app, as you know, but just bear with me here and pretend this is the old Twitter, okay? So if you click a link, nothing really happens and the server returns the new contents. 
and only then the whole thing appears in front of you. Even if you use Ajax, it's quite common to do this initial wait and then bring the content at this, after the server is done. However, um, when it comes to a nap, um, it's crucial that things happen the second you lay your finger on the screen, and this effect is even larger on apps than on websites, because on the apps, the, the UI will actually move and pages will fly out. So to do this sort of stuff, we need to be like, quite clever around how we animate state. So look at what happens when I click this tweet. Um, in the middle of the animation, I get this weird stage where the page has been pushed, but my content is not here. So what this is actually doing is it's taking whatever content it had in the past, in this case, the tweet, because it was already there, and it's loading the, the tweets in the background. Doing all of this is hard. Like, actually doing all of this is incredibly hard. You need to do 60 FPS animated routes with perfect component data fetching, back via global cache, or something like that. That's what we needed, at the very least. You can wait for React Suspense to really nail this, but also, according to the latest global warming estimates, we only have like 10 years good on this planet, so who knows? Who knows? Mm. So in terms of, actually, of actual libraries, the two we considered for our project were React Navigation and React Native Navigation. They work similarly, except React-Native-Navigation takes a bit more of the native, native stack, so it actually maps to um, native iOS and Android navigators, and that means you get more, a more native experience out of it because you get the actual native elements, but it also means you get less customization. Whereas React Navigation recreates a lot of the iOS and Android interface, and in return, you can just about do anything you want with it, but it also, it's also a bit more, um, it feels a bit more alien to your users. Now, both of them sort of have this concept of your roots existing in a tree, and you sort of define where your screens exist in relationship to others, and the navigator handles the transitions for you between them. And this is sort of a constant between both of them. Now, this screenshot is from Xcode, and we don't have anything as nice in React Native yet, but it's sort of the same model. And you can imagine how by stacking navigators, you can get these types of speciality in an app. Um, <laughs> well, fuck, this is the animation section all over again, so let's skip it. So, when it comes to um, all of this that we have talked, markup, styling, debugging, navigation, and animation, um, this is a bit the areas I wanted to cover today because we are a bit strapped for time. And basically, to sum up, I have some closing thoughts on this. Um, I would love to touch on a bit more stuff, like for instance, performance is a huge one, but luckily, everybody else, or everybody else in this conference already has, so I'm going to spare you that. And I'm going to you with React Native is pretty cool. So basically, if you are in a position right now where you are considering React Native, um, it's really worth giving it a shot. Like, you're at, the, at the React Native conference, so you have already been convinced about this, probably. But I guess it's always good to get this external validation to actually take this to stakeholders. Um, we did actually manage to rewrite a quite complex app in under six months with a three-person team. Um, I'm kind of proud of that one because, like, Jesus Christ, that was a lot. Mm. And React Native's learning curve is not steep, but React's learning curve is, like, I think my experience with React Native has taught me a ton about React that I knew about. Um, I didn't know about, like, per optimizing for pure performance, I didn't know about exact specifics of context, and now I do. And finally, yeah, do not fly at 5 a.m. That's a terrible idea. Do not do that to yourself. Uh, do not steal your friend's pants. We have gone over this. And that's everything for me. Thank you so much. <laughs>